Good morning once again. So glad you are here. We're in the book of Revelation. We're going through a study uh, in the book of Revelation, and we are in chapter 2. Uh, as we go through the letters to the churches, there's seven real-life churches in uh, Asia Minor at the t that time, so referred to as Asia, but it's modern-day Turkey, geographically speaking. And so we come to the letter today uh, to the church at Thyatira, the letter to the church at Thyatira. Now, uh, let me tell you briefly, I've, I've mentioned as we've gone through some of the first couple of letters that these towns were famous for various things or prominent in various ways, but I'll tell you Thyatira's the smallest of the towns, it's the least significant of these towns. But you might notice in your Bible, it's got the longest letter written to it. And so that's, uh, that's good news for us here in Cushing, Oklahoma, because it means that Jesus still cares about small towns. Amen? But what we'll see from this small town, we, we certainly wouldn't want to associate ourselves with them at all, because this is a small town, but they got big problems in this small town. And as it is the longest letter, I want to kind of... Uh, just go through it with you instead of reading it all at once and then kind of coming back through it. It'd be a little bit faster if we kind of go through it together. Let me tell you, first of all, about the town of Thyatira. It's, like I said, small. They were famous for one thing, and that is uh, purple wool was made there. Now, if you remember in our study in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, there was a lady named Lydia that was Paul's first convert in Europe. She was in Philippi, but she is... Uh, titled Lydia of Thyatira. And if you remember what she sold, she sold purple garments. And so in Thyatira, they uh, were more of a blue-collar kind of a town, a hard-working town, and that's one thing, that was the thing that they were famous for, was just blue, I mean, excuse me, purple wool. And they would usually make it, by the way, from a shellfish called the murex that would be harvested from the Mediterranean Sea, and they would use that shellfish in order to create this dye uh, which was a very extensive process and difficult and costly. That's why it was so expensive. And if you've ever heard about purple in the Bible, particularly referred to a, uh, as those in, in royalty would wear purple, not because that was the royal color, but only royalty could afford purple because it was so expensive. So that's one thing they had at Thyatira was this purple wool. Another thing they were known for, and in the inscriptions we find there in this uh, town, it's a modern-day Turkish town in Thyatira, was their, their labor guilds. And it's kind of similar to a modern-day labor union, but there were uh, big labor guilds here, and these were the home of some of the labor guilds, the headquarters of some of them. Remember, each labor guild had their own god, and they would have their union meeting, so to speak, in that god's temple where they'd be required to do sacrifices and things like that. So often, these labor guilds would cause problems for the early Christians. And can you imagine if you were in one of those guilds and required to do the sacrifices... And you become a believer. And Jesus, now Jesus, having followed Jesus, will have costed you your career as you can no longer go make those sacrifices in an idol's temple. Conscience would for, uh, forbid you from doing so. And so that's one thing that they were known for in Thyatira. So Jesus writes his letter to him, And in typical fashion, he will first uh, address the church. He'll introduce himself. He'll tell them what they're doing good. And it's, it's pretty good. I'm going to give you a, a warning here. You're going to think, man, it's a good church. But don't jump to any conclusions right off the bat, okay? Because they got a lot of problems here in Thyatira. He'll address that. And then he'll give a promise at the end. Here's what it says. Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Here's the author. Thus says the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. And so remember this uh, these author descriptions in these seven letters come from chapter 1, John's first vision of Jesus while he was there on the island of Patmos. And each one is kind of different. And, and each uh, attribute of Christ that's mentioned addresses some of the problems they had at this church. So Jesus, first of all, says, thus says the Son of God. This is the first and only time Jesus is called that in the book of Revelation, called that many other places in Scripture. You know, often in the Gospels, he would call himself the Son of Man, right? And that really referred to his humanity. Also a, a, a Daniel 7 reference, but it, it referred to his humanity, that he came as a person, incarnate. 
and suffered like a person would and was tempted like a person would be. But when he's called, when he's called the Son of God, that's an authoritative claim. That's when he's saying, look, pay attention. Somebody in charge here. Also, one of the temples there in Thyatira, this is just some archaeology that they've dug up, uh, was dedicated to Apollo. Apollo, and the labor unions also often worshipped Apollo as well as whatever deity they had for that labor specific genre. And Apollo is referred to as the son of God because in Greek mythology he was the son of Zeus. So he's referred to, so there's even have coins they've dug up that have a picture of Apollo and it says in Greek, the son of God. And so maybe Jesus is saying, uh, hey, thus says the real son of God, the actual son of God, pay attention. He refers to himself as the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. You, you ever grown up uh, as a child just, just, just knew when mom or dad gave you that look? You know what I'm talking about? That look that you, like, you knew you were in trouble. Like they didn't have to say anything. But you knew when you got to the car, when you got home, trouble was coming. And it was actually worse if they didn't say something, Right? Like you would try to get him to say something just to get it out because you didn't know how bad it was going to be. So this is, this is the gaze of Christ. And it says that it's like fiery flames. And imagine a person with eyes. You know, some, think about somebody with striking or piercing eyes. His are like literal flames peering into you. He has all comprehensive perception. He knows all. He sees all. Nothing escapes the view of Christ. And as this word of judgment comes, you see an authoritative figure placing himself in the seat of judgment it also says that his feet are like fine bronze in revelation chapter 19 verse 15 it says that he treads the wine press of the fierce wrath of god that's what his feet are for and so we are not getting a a kind gentle sweet you know nine pounds six ounce baby jesus here we're getting a very fierce harsh individual that's squaring up with the church at Thyatira because they, a, a, they need a strong word. And so he starts with their commendation here in his verse 19. I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. Hey, so far so good, right? He just said that they were a loving church. This church had love. Well, that's better than Ephesus. Remember Ephesus, the first letter? They had everything but love. He said, you've gotten all this right, but you've forsaken your first love. At least in Thyatira, they've got the most important thing here, it seems, thi- uh, love, and also faithfulness. And he's going to reference some of the believers who had not fallen into the error that the other ones did. So maybe he's talking about those believers who remained faithful. And then you see out of their love and faithfulness, two things come, service and endurance. Service just simply means taking care of other people considering others' needs above your own. By the, word, it's, by the way, it's the Greek word that we get the, the, the English word deacon from. Deacons are servants, and that's what it says, service and endurance, long-suffering, patience, being able to hang on and hold tight in the midst of all the conflict and, and pressure that would be around them to, to fall to these false idols and false gods. So he starts out and says, man, you're loving, that's good, faithful, service, endurance, you're doing well there. Here's what he goes on to say, and this is probably the greatest compliment. He says, I know that your last works are greater than your first. Your last works are greater than your first. So so here's what it's saying. They are growing spiritually. They are maturing spiritually. The things they're doing today are even better things than they did when the the church first started. Somebody founded this church, maybe Lydia from Philippi went back to Thyatira and started this church, or maybe some of the other believers that learned from Paul at Ephesus went out and started this church. But now the church has grown a little bit, and they're doing better things now than they did when they first started. That's a question we ought to be asking ourselves here at First Baptist Church on a regular basis. Are we doing greater things today than we did in the past? Is our church progressing? And you say, well... Well, uh, in what way do you mean? Well, here's what I mean. Uh, In ways that bless and honor Jesus, in the things that Jesus calls great, are we growing or did we used to do better things? 
And that's a question we got to be evaluating and answering as a church, but also as individuals. We each need to be asking ourselves that question. Are the things you are doing today as a follower of Jesus greater than the first things you did when you first got saved, when you first believed? Oftentimes we get a little, we get a little on fire when we first get saved. And somehow the fire fizzles after a little while. Are you doing greater things today? Are you walking closer to Jesus today than you used to be? Um, I see in my own life, sometimes I'll, I'll read sermons that I wrote a couple of years ago. Or, or I'll be preaching on a, on a topic or a passage, and I'll think, ooh, I've already preached on that. Maybe I already have some notes. That'll save me a little bit of time, a little bit of work. And I can hardly ever go back and read them. They're almost painful to read for me. I think that's because God's teaching me things and growing me and developing me. Hopefully that's, that's the case. And so they're growing. They're doing better. I, I heard somebody say one time, uh, Christians can't coast. If you're a follower of Jesus, you, you can't just coast. Because we're not going downhill, we're going uphill in life. The world, the temptation that we face, when you coast, you coast backwards. You don't coast forward as a Christian. So if you're not moving forward, if you're not growing spiritually, then you are backsliding. And you're in reverse. And so, so far, so good. But, you know, like I said, that's a long letter. This is a long letter, and that's just the first two verses. So Jesus saves a lot of words to get on about what they're doing wrong. He says, but I have this against you. Wouldn't you hate to hear that from Jesus? But I have this against you. It reminds me, actually, the Old Testament. Some of the kings of Israel are said to be good kings, but they failed to do this, this, or this. And I often think about it in my own life. If, if Jesus was evaluating my life, well, you got this right, but here's where you're lacking here. But this is where this church is lacking. I have this against you. Here's what it says. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat meat sacrificed to idols. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now, um, I'm just guessing. In your life, you've probably never, never met a woman named Jezebel. You've probably never met a man named Judas or Adolf. Because some characters tend to taint a name forever. Well, that is the case for a woman named Jezebel in the Old Testament. Interestingly, we've been going through First and Second Kings on Wednesday nights. We've been talking about Jezebel. But this woman was a queen of Israel married to a guy named Ahab. And certainly she is the worst character, female character, in the entire Old Testament. And so I don't think her name was actually Jezebel. I think Jesus is using that name to refer to her. Have you ever been so disgusted at somebody that you couldn't even say their name? Like, you know that person who we won't talk about? That's kind of, or you use a, a harsh name to refer to that person? Jesus is name calling here. That's what he's doing. He's referring to this woman as a Jezebel. It's not nice. And as a matter of fact, when I first wrote this into my notes, I wrote this. John is name-calling. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. No, John wrote this book down, but this is a letter from Jesus. I guess all the, the whole Bible would fall into that category as well. But Jesus is referring to this woman as the worst female character in the entire Old Testament. And this woman's uh, crimes, if you get First and Second Kings, really Second Kings just has her death, which was graphic. Um, but her crimes were uh, that she essentially single-handedly nationalized idol worship in Israel. She was responsible for making Baal worship corporate in the whole nation, making it even mandatory, building temples and idols. She was married to a guy named Ahab, which is kind of a slimy character, just a weak guy, and she just did whatever she wanted to do. He never corrected her on that. He shouldn't even have married her because she wasn't a believer. She was not an Israelite. This is why you shouldn't flirt to convert young people because it'll end up messing you up, and that's what happened to Ahab, the whole town, the whole nation of Israel. And uh, one thing she did, like I said, Baal worship. Also, um, sexual immorality came right along with Baal worship. Now, now, now think about this. If you're creating a god of your, of your own creation, you're going to make that god promote things that you like, right? So often these ancient idols that, that Israel be led astray by, the Moabite idols, 
uh, the Baals and Asherahs, often worship of them included sexual immorality. Because whoever was coming up with that idol just included that. Oh, 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 and this God wants us to do this. And so you see that all the time. And that's a temptation for people and for the Israelites over and over. And so um, this woman is also committing sexual morality. That's what this, this figure in the Old Testament uh, promoted. Also, when a guy named Jehu, who is a king, comes to execute God's judgment against Jezebel, he um, accuses her of sorcery and prostitution. So these things all took place in Israel because of this woman Jezebel and because of Ahab, her husband. And it's by this name that Jesus refers to this woman, whoever she is, in Thyatira. Not nice. Not a pleasant thing to say. And even in our day today, thousands of years later, that name, if you refer to somebody as a Jezebel, it ain't nice, right? You're not calling her virtuous for sure. And so here's what he says, that um, we, you tolerate her. Who, she calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual morality and to eat meat uh, sacrificed to idols. And so she calls herself a prophetess. Now listen, a prophet or prophetess is one who hears from God and communicates God's word to people. And so by Jesus saying she calls herself a prophetess, he's saying she don't hear from God. What she tells you doesn't come from me. She comes up with that from some other source, but it didn't come in from me. Um, not only is she teaching the wrong stuff, and that's bad enough, leading God's people astray, she's also putting God's name on her false teaching, which is even worse, which is even worse. When I was in high school, I was dating this girl, and uh, she came to me one day and said, uh, Michael, I don't think, the, the Lord is telling me that he doesn't want us to date anymore. Has that ever happened to you? Just me. Okay, thanks, guys. All alone up here on the stage. <laughs> Love it. And I remember thinking at that moment, <laughs> well, that ain't what God's telling me, you know? And, and here's, here's why we see a, a lot of prophets in the Old Testament, but we don't see a lot of modern-day prophets for two reasons. First of all, if their job is to hear the word of God and communicate the word to people, well, well, God took it a step further and wrote it down for us. Amen? So we have God's word. Also, if you're a New Testament follower of Jesus, you have another thing. God's Holy Spirit living in your body. Since the day of Pentecost, at the moment of salvation, we are given his Holy Spirit to live with us. And he can speak directly to his people if he wants to. And that's what I was saying, like, girl, that's not what the Holy Spirit's telling me. But oftentimes we do that. We, we want to spiritualize things as Christians, so we put God's name on them. Well, God's telling me, God's showing me. Here's what God said. I, I know I have a friend who does that. God, he'll say, um, hey, Mike, God gave me a word for you. He wants me to tell you this. And, and I, don't, I say, thank you, brother. You know, I'm, I'm kind about it. But in my heart, you know, I'm thinking, look. He could talk to me if he wants to, you know, like, I got the same Holy Spirit as you, brother, but um, we ought to be careful when somebody comes to us with that uh, title of prophet, and also we ought to be careful when we take on the title of prophet by putting God's word on our word. When we do that, well, God wants me, look, God just told me this or God told me that. Listen, if God hasn't really told you that, then you're guilty of violating the third commandment using the Lord's name in vain. You're putting God's name on something that he didn't say. Be careful. And this woman calls herself a prophetess, and she's obviously come with some kind of new revelation. Whenever somebody comes and tells you, look, the Bible's good, but I got a new revelation. I got something new on top of the Bible to add to it or to, to correct it, you ought to know right there that's a false prophet that is speaking to you. And she's told them that it's okay to worship these idols. And imagine if you were in one of these trade guilds and we're feeling the pressure of losing your career because you're a follower of Jesus now. And a teacher comes along and says, look, you don't have to lose your career. You can worship Jesus and worship the God, the idol of that trade. It's okay. Boy, that'd be, that'd be awfully tempting, wouldn't it? You'd go, man, really? Well, maybe, maybe I can't. Maybe I can still be a cobbler or a baker or a, or a candlestick maker or whatever. 
And so she's done that. She's led these people astray. And it goes on to say, and we'll read it in just a moment, but that, that, that she's teaching them the secrets of Satan. That's in verse 14, or 24. The, the secrets of Satan is part of her uh, doctrine. So she's tapped into something wicked and demonic and calling it godly. And so you've got to test these prophets. And they were, um, look, these people were committed to love and service, and that's good. But they weren't committed to the word of God. They weren't testing prophets and people who proclaim to speak the word of God. And that's their fault. And so when a person comes to you and says they're a prophet, uh, I won't go into this too much because we did the whole uh, book of uh, 1 John, even 2 and 3 John mention it. But you got to test them. Put them to the test. Don't just trust it. I mean, if somebody comes to you and they say they have a word from God for you, they might. You can be open to the possibility, but don't blindly trust whatever they say. And that's the problem here. So does that person's character line up with the word of God? Are they teaching you something contrary to the word of God? And what are they saying exactly about Jesus? This is how we test a prophet. And so it says that she was teaching him to commit sexual immorality and eat meat sacrificed to idols. Um, like I said, always part of idol worship is sexual immorality, it seems like. Meat sacrificed to idols is a big topic in the New Testament. Uh, in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council, one thing that the believers in Jerusalem told to Paul to tell the new believers, the Gentiles that were getting saved, was not to eat meat sacrificed to idols. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul goes into a long discussion on this topic about whether or not they should eat meat sacrificed to idols. And uh, essentially, he says, an idol is nothing. It's made up. It's a fake god. So if somebody goes in and, and sacrifices an animal to a fake god and then brings that meat out into the marketplace and sells it at a reduced price, that's a good deal. Because who cares? There's no such thing as a made-up idol. But the problem was in the church at Corinth, some of the believers in that church had come out of a lifestyle of idol worship. And they'd left that false worship of that fake god. And in their hearts, their conscience wouldn't allow them to eat that meat. They knew where it came from. And so Paul tells them, look, if it violates your, your brother or sister in Christ's conscience if it offends them, if it causes them to stumble, maybe stumble back into idol worship, then don't eat it. Abstain from it for the sake of your brother or sister in Christ. So here they're eating it without any regard to how it affects the other believers in the church there at Thyatira. And also, they may even be going into the temples and eating it in the temple where it was just sacrificed as part of a worship. And so that's a problem. So sexual morality and eating meat sacrificed to idols. This woman was causing these people to commit physical and spiritual adultery. That's her crime. And the crime of the church at Thyatira, did you catch it? In verse 20, you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Get this, their sin was tolerance. And that sounds different than things you hear today, doesn't it? See, we're told today that the only real sin is intolerance. The only thing we should not tolerate is intolerance. Have you gotten that message loud and clear? That's what we're told, isn't it? But Jesus says, look, and maybe for the sake of love. Maybe they didn't want to offend these people. Maybe they wanted to help them, serve them. But their sin was tolerating sin, wickedness. Listen, I'm going to tell you today. There's some things that you need to be intolerant of. There's some things that you need to say, no, that's wrong. No, that's wrong. It's not correct. It's false. No, that is sin, and I'm not going to put up with it. There's some things in your home that you need to be intolerant of. There's some things in your church that you need to be intolerant of, in your community that you need to be intolerant of. There's some things that you need to say no to. That ain't okay. Now, listen, we tolerate the people. We don't tolerate their sin. We love the people, but we need to be clear with what the Word of God says. When we tolerate people's sin, when we call people's sin not sin, we are not doing them any favors. We're telling them that the thing that's dragging them to hell is okay. When the truth is, it's hurting them. Their sin was tolerance of sin. They were loving, but they weren't committed to the word of God or they wouldn't have put up with this. And then let's read verse 21. This is incredible. He says, I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. 
Jesus says, I gave her time to repent. Wow. She's leading his people astray, getting them into all kinds of wickedness, teaching them to serve false gods and idols. And Jesus, in his mercy, still gives her time to repent. He should have zapped her sorry rear end the moment she started. And he'd have been justified in doing that, right? But because he's loving and merciful, he delays his judgment. Aren't you glad he delayed his judgment on you? Oh, my goodness. That's me. He put up with me for a long time. He delayed her judgment. You know, God might be delaying your judgment right now. You know that? If he's been calling you to salvation, telling you to get right with your life, get some stuff out of your life, you think, well, I keep doing it, nothing bad happens. Listen, that's God's patience, not his ignorance. He's given her time to turn around and get right, but she won't do it. I gave her time to repent, he says in verse 20, but she won't repent. Verse 22, so look, here's where it gets harsh. I will throw her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction unless they repent of her works. Judgment is coming. God has been patient, but time is running out. Verse 23, listen, it says, I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each one according to your works. Here's what I think is happening there. He said he's going to throw her into a sick bed. This almost certainly references her death. He's going to give her a sickness that will cause her to die. That is not uncommon in the Bible. We see that kind of stuff a lot, God's judgment. Even in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, those who take of the Lord's Supper in an incorrect manner, it says some are sick and others have fallen asleep because of that sin. So it's not that uncommon for God to strike someone dead because of their sin. But listen, here's what's happening, I think. I think the ones that are her children that are struck dead, I think those are her, uh, her followers, those who ascribe to that belief system. I don't think it's necessarily her physical children. I mean, it could be. And the truth is, our sin has consequences on our children. And that may be a consequence. But I think this is actually her followers. And I think it says this, the ones who, so there's two groups here, those who commit adultery with her. So I think that's spiritual adultery. And I think that's believers who commit spiritual adultery with this woman. That language is used a lot in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament. Uh, worshiping false idols is seen as spiritual adultery. Uh, and so I think that's believers who are led astray. But the ones that say that are her children, see, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're his child, okay? I think these are her children, her followers that aren't believers that are going to be struck dead. And he says, the purpose of their judgment is a testimony. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give according to each one, each one according to their works. That seem harsh that Jesus would, uh, would strike this person dead for their sin? That he would judge him so harshly? If that seems harsh to you, you probably are not very familiar with the Old Testament of the Bible. That happens a lot. Let me tell you this, same God. Amen? The God of the Old Testament, same God of the New Testament. And he's no longer this child who came, born in a manger, the meek, mild Jesus who was our incarnate Savior. He's now the glorified judge over all. And so he says, verse 24, I, will, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, you who do not hold to this teaching, you who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I am not putting any burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. So it seems there's people in that church that haven't gone headlong into the, the idolatry of Jezebel, this Jezebel figure. They haven't committed spiritual and physical immorality and adultery with her. They're still followers of Jesus. He goes, I'm not putting that burden on you. Each person will be judged for their own sins. That's clear throughout God's word. But he is saying this, only do this. Hold on to what you have until I come. Stay steady. Hold on. Hold tight to your faith. Don't be led astray into that garbage until I come back because I'm coming. Hold on. How do you hold on to what you have? 
As I mentioned earlier, you, you can't coast as a Christian. In order to be, move, to be staying still, you've got to be moving forward. I mean, you can't stand still. You're either going backwards or you're going forward. So if you're going to hold on, you've got to be moving forward. You've got to be growing. You've got to be committed to his word and committed to worship, committed to the body of believers. He says, hold on until I come. He says, this, here's the promise. The one who conquers, who keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery, just as I receive this from my Father. I also give him the morning star. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the, to the uh, churches. Says to, the, to the rest of Thyatira, he kind of addresses the rest of Thyatira with this promise. Hold on to what you have, and if you do, if you endure, if you persevere, I'll give you authority over the nations. That's part of the millennial reign of Christ. We as believers will reign with Christ in his millennial kingdom here on earth. I'll save the details on that for the, later on in the study of Revelation. We'll get all the way into that, I guarantee you. But anyways, we will give him this authority. And then he says this. I will also give him the morning star Another one of these pictures, these symbols in Revelation. There's a million of them. It's hard to understand what each one of them means. But this one, I believe, is referring to Jesus himself. Because of Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, it says this. I am, this is Jesus speaking, I am the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Jesus refers to himself as the morning star, and he promises those who endure, who conquer, who hold tight to what they have, their faith in Jesus. And he says, you will get the morning star. I will give you the morning star. <clears throat> Listen, the idea that you should come to Jesus because he'll give you good things is true. But the good thing is himself. The good thing is Jesus. You know the best part about heaven? You know, will it be streets of gold? Yes. Will be mansions, absolutely. But the best part about heaven is Jesus. And we will be with Jesus forever. We will be in his presence continually for all of eternity. Come to, come to Jesus, not so you can be rich, not so you can be healthy. Come to Jesus so you can have Jesus. That's the gift. The bright and morning star. Come to Jesus today. And he will give you himself. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. If you've never come to Jesus, if you've never given him your heart and your life, I want to give you a chance this morning to pray and ask him into your life. Ask him into your heart to forgive your sins, the things you've done wrong. And then he will give you himself. His presence, His Holy Spirit here on earth today and for the rest of your life and His presence forever in heaven when you step out of this earth and out of this world. Come to Jesus. If God has been patient with you, if He's delayed His judgment on you, don't make a mockery of His patience. And don't get to the point where his patience runs out and then judgment comes. Repent today of those things before it's too late. Would you bow your head for me and close your eyes? And I want you to have a moment to simply focus on what God might be speaking to you about this morning. I want you to have a moment to pray. And I want you to answer, have you given your heart and your life to Jesus? Have you asked him to come into your heart and forgive your sins and begin a relationship with him? Some of us there may be thinking today, well, I know I need to, but I'm going to wait a little bit longer. I'm going to wait a little bit longer. Listen. Listen. 
Don't try his patience. If you need to get right with him today, do it right now. You don't know when judgment will come. Or maybe you've been a believer for a while now, but if you uh, had to be honest, when you hear that por- that part in the letters, we've seen them in all the letters, but today we saw it again. But I have this against you, Jesus says. You think of maybe something in your life that he has against you. I want to give you a chance right now to repent of that. And very simply, that means to confess it to him and commit to changing in that area. Ask him for his help to help you change. I'm going to give you a moment to pray this morning. ask if you're here today and that's you that you you've just prayed this morning and asked Jesus to come into your heart and forgive your sins here in just a moment we're going to stand and if that's you I'm going to ask you to come forward and make that public today and we'll get your baptism scheduled and we'll help you with those next steps of walking with Jesus if you're here and God's been laying on your heart that you need to become a member of First Baptist Church I'm going to ask you to come at that time as well. Come forward. Make that public today. Maybe you need to follow through with believer's baptism. You've been saved, but you need to follow through with baptism. Would you come and make that commitment today as well? So as we we stand this morning, would you come? Go ahead and stand, and we'll sing, but you go ahead and come. Make your way out the aisle and come make that commitment public today. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Except y'all, go ahead and come on up. This this time we'll do our child dedication. Uh, We're going to have a time of of dedication of some, some little angels up here. We're so excited for that. So let me explain to you this, this morning really quickly what it means uh, to, to have a child dedication, dedicate your children to the Lord. Uh, essentially, this is not any kind of salvation act on the part of these children. Um, it doesn't impart special grace. Actually, it's more about the parents and the church than it is about the kids uh, themselves. And also, it's a celebration of new life. And that's something to celebrate, isn't it? When God blesses our, our people with, with little ones, we're excited about that, and we want to celebrate, and that's what we're going to do uh, this morning. And so, um, first of all, I'm going to ask our, our parents to make a commitment, and, and at the end, I'll ask you if, you, if you commit to these things, parents, uh, would you say, we will? <clears throat> so this morning, do you commit to always consi- uh, considering your child a blessing and a stewardship that God has given you? We're a little slow on that one. We will. Okay, good job. Do you commit to raising your child in a manner consistent with the Word of God? There you go. Do you commit to prioritizing church and corporate worship in your life and the life of your children? 
Do you commit to pray regularly for your child, specifically for the day when they would place their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation? Okay, at this time, I'm going um, to introduce each one. Actually, I'm going to start down here and uh, introduce each, each one. Yeah, and we have a certificate and a, and a small gift for each one. Okay. I need you to grab that list. Thank you. Well, first of all, this is maybe the littlest one. We'll start with the littlest one. This is Lila Jane Beasley. Her parents are uh, Dawn and Jeff Beasley, and she's only one month old. We're excited about there. And I I forgot to say, if you're uh, here as I introduce each one, if you're here as a visitor or family member, uh, if you'd like to stand and and be recognized as well, we want to recognize you as well. So let me try that again. Lila, Jane Beasley, Don, and Jeff. Amen. Let's clap for each one. Thank you. We're excited about her. What a blessing. What a blessing. All right. Here's your certificate. We have a small gift for you, too. This is... uh, Elsie Ray Esom. She's awake. That's right. And this is, of course, Logan and Tara Esom, her uh, mom and dad. We're sure excited about her. Oh, she's smiling. She likes the spotlight. She's going to be a performer like her daddy, huh? Maybe. Maybe. Hey, this is um, little Reagan Wood, uh, Reagan Dawn Wood, and this is her parents, Gavin Wood and Bree Driggs, and we're excited for Reagan. And if your family, would you stand? (laughs) Hey, next up is Willow Moore, and her parents are Ryan and Naomi Moore, and they're here today. I know they have a crowd. Y'all better stand back there. I know y'all. Uh, so excited for her. Thank you. There you go. There you go. See the cue. And this is McKenna Stuckey next, and her parents, uh, Tyler and Jovi Stuckey. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> They're being shy. Another l- pretty little one here. How, how old? Two months. Two months. Okay. So he, they're just a, well, m- a month younger down there on the end. Uh, this is Terry Bradley the third. And this is Terry Bradley the second. <laughs> and Stephanie Bradley. And so we're sure excited about them. There they are. <laughs> Here's Jace Hauser and parents uh, Chelsea and Zach Hauser. Family there. There you go. There you go. And so we're excited, so excited about these young people, and we're excited to see them grow up in our church. And we think about the days when they'll they'll do performances on stage at Vacation Bible School, and we think about the days when they'll go to camps. And be part of our our children's ministry. And so we're so thankful to God for each one of them. But you know, when God gives us the blessing of young people and children in our church, that's more than just a blessing for us, church. That's also a a stewardship. It's something he expects us to take good care of. And so next I have a commitment uh, for the church. And church, I'm going to read a few things. And if you commit to these as part of the First Baptist Church family, will you respond by saying, we will. First of all, Do you commit to loving, supporting, and encouraging these families towards godliness? Good job. Do you commit to pray for these families and for these children? So important, so important. And do you commit to serving these families here at First Baptist Church? Thank you so much. So if you're here today, you're making a commitment to these families to love on them and take care of them, provide for them. So we're We're so excited for them. We're so excited that that these young people have made a commitment today, one they've already made, I'm sure, in the past, but making it public that they're going to raise their children to love Jesus and to live according to his word. 
Let me take a moment and pray for them and uh, just thank God for them and pray God's blessings on each one of these little lives. And then um, I want you to just also keep in mind, we normally would have you walk by and congratulate each one. We got some pretty little ones up here, so especially with the little, little ones, be careful. But, but all of them, we don't want to pass anything around, okay? So be careful. If you want to come up and just talk to them and wave. Are waves okay, folks? Everybody's okay with the wave, so we're comfortable there. We'll do that. All right. Okay, let me pray. And then also uh, for moms, but also all of our adult women, we have a, a flower for you on the way out. So as you exit that way, uh, the gentleman will be there with the offering baskets for offerings and the flowers for our ladies that we want to celebrate today. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you for each one of these young lives and these parents, God, that you have blessed them with these children. God, we know every life is a blessing. Every child is a blessing from you, and they're special, and they're important. So God, first of all, we thank you for each one. We thank you as part of their church family that we get to see them grow up and learn about you in Sunday school and, and go to all the uh, children's activities. And God, we pray for the moment that they would each individually hear the gospel and turn from their sins in faith towards you and be saved. And Father, we pray for all the little moments that will take place here at First Baptist that will hopefully set them up and make them sensitive to your Holy Spirit as you call them to salvation. We thank you for these parents that are here, God. We just pray that you would support and encourage them in their darkest hours, Father, when it's difficult to be a parent, when everything goes wrong. Father, would you be there to give them that extra little bit of grace that they need to get by for the hour or the moment or the day? God, we thank you for each one. We pray your blessings on each family. It's in your wonderful name I do pray. Amen.